Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
And now I want to appeal to you the intimacy of what dining together signifies. Can I appeal to your heart of what dining together signifies? In the days when Jesus was walking this earth, dining together was a sign of friendship, unity, and intimacy. In the Bible, dining together was a way to express love, service, and unity. Amen. So in the days when Jesus in the story, we're going to get to the story. We're going to get there in the days when Jesus was walking and he chose to dine with this individual. If you know your Bible, you should know at least who I'm kind of talking about. Maybe it's one or two other stories, but you know where we going. So in the days of Jesus, him choosing to dine with this individual, he was choosing to express friendship, unity and intimacy with a sinner and an outsider and an outcast. So Jesus was saying, I am going to extend the hand of friendship, unity, and intimacy with you in relationship with me, even though you are what is considered to be a sinner, you are considered to be an outcast, you are considered to be an enemy of the people, amen? And Jesus chose, this is the place where I will dine and show everyone what my love really is. And in the Bible times, it was very rare for a rabbi to go and dine with a sinner. It, people were not used to that. What do you mean? You, they were calling him teacher and rabbi, and he was teaching them. Remember, last night, we have to stay kingdom-minded, and our mind is focused on the kingdom of God, and we have to stay kingdom-focused. Jesus, in his parables, he spoke from a kingdom perspective, but he used earthly analogies to get them to understand the kingdom's perspectives. Amen. So as we think about this, we have a teacher who understands the perspective of the kingdom of God but he is willing to go and sit with a man who is an outcast who is a sinner who has no friends who is not really liked by anybody and the main reason he's not liked is because of his profession amen so because of what you do they don't want to like you because of what you do you are outcast to everybody else that may be around you all because of what you do Amen. And it was extremely rare for a Jew to dine with a tax collector. Hmm. But Jesus extends his hand of friendship, intimacy, and love, and unity, even sharing. E and watch this. When he decided to dine with this person, he was deciding to even share in his shame and guilt. See, when Jesus decides to sit and sup with us, he has decided to even share in our shame and in our guilt and in our condemnation. So he hasn't just decided to sit at the table just to poke at everybody else and make them mad. He's decided to also sit at the table to share with you in your shame and your guilt from what you believe you have done, from what you may have done, or from what people have said to you you have done. He has decided, I will still sit at the table with you and dine with you because my hand of friendship is extending over to you because that is who I am. And as believers in Jesus and in the Bible, in this body of Christ that we say that we walk in, that is a choice that we have to at some point make. Am I willing to sit at the table and sup with you no matter the decisions and the things that you may have done in your past? Right. Am I willing to sit at the table and dine with you no matter what it may look like or what you looked like 10 years ago? But can I sit at the table and dine with you right now? Can I sit at the table and dine with you even though nobody else likes you even though everybody else thinks something negative about you can I sit at the table and dine with you no matter the thoughts and the comments and the ways that people may treat you amen, amen. and Jesus is extending this hand to this man because he's showing everyone in the kingdom of God all are welcome Amen. I will say it again in the kingdom of God all are welcome Amen. now we will not misconstrue that with the 2024 statement because there are things with obedience that go with the kingdom of God but all have the extended hand of opportunity to be welcome into his kingdom mm -hmm. and Jesus was showing that as he was extending his hand to this man but one thing to notice 
as we get into the text and we'll get there, I promise, I want to give you the before version and then we get to the text so you can see it. One thing to notice is the person he will dine with has wanted to be fully restored. Mm. I'm going to say that again. When we get to the text, you'll see it. I hope it just jumps out at you. Amen. I hope it, the way that you was just jumping, I pray that it jumps yeah, out at yeah, you when you yeah. see this in the text. I pray you see it. You say, wow, I never noticed that before. Oh, wow, I forgot about that. But I pray it jumps up at you because the person who Jesus chose to dine with, he wanted to be fully restored. Why is this important? Because the key to walking out of darkness is the desire to want to be fully restored. Oh my God, I'm going to say it again. The key to walking out of darkness is a desire to want to be fully restored. Some of us think that the key to walking out of darkness is just me simply going to church and saying amen and listening to gospel music and saying a prayer. But the key to walking out of darkness is the desire to want to be fully restored. Something has to be desired deep down on the inside of me to where I want to be fully restored back unto God and church alone does not do that a good sermon alone does not do that a song alone does not do that an individual prayer does not do that a group prayer does not do that my mind does not do that my body does not do that something on the inside of me has to want to be fully restored into the kingdom of God and we wonder why so many people can't walk out of darkness. Well, I challenge you today. Could it yet be that you don't have a desire to be fully restored? Oh my God, I'm preaching, but you don't like it because it's poking at something. But where is your desire at to be fully restored in Jesus? Not 50%, not 60%, not 70%, not 80%, but a desire to be fully fully restored oh my god we want to walk out of darkness have a desire for the restoration that god has placed in front of us Amen. and can i propose something to you that even when it seems god is being obscure or faint in your life if you retain the desire to be fully restored, never forget that he has a desire as well to fully restore you. Come on, somebody, don't leave me by myself. It may look like God is being obscure or mysterious or faint or not in your life, but that does not mean that his desire for your restoration has faded. Oh my God, how many of us, when it felt like God was being in obscure, or he left us, or he wasn't around, did that snatch away our desire to be fully restored by him? Amen. Oh, you, can, you ain't got to amen that, but I know I'm not by myself because I know what we go through as people. I just don't feel like God is here. I don't feel like he's present. I feel like I'm all alone. I feel like he left me. I feel like I keep dealing with this because there's something wrong with me and I don't think it's ever going to leave I don't think I'll ever change I think I'll always be like this because God isn't right here right now anyways but I'm here to tell you that God's desire for your full restoration is deeper than the desire that you have for yourself even when you don't feel it and you don't recognize it, his desire to restore you runs so deep that his plan for you was even stated before you were even born. That's good. That's that went over some of y'all here. <laughs> God's desire runs deeper than yours for your own personal being. God's desire and love about you, oh my God, runs deeper than anything that you can have for yourself. Anything that your husband can have, your wife can have, your children can have. God's desire for your restoration runs deeper and deeper and deeper than the deepest abyss. It's deeper than where the Meg lives in the movie. It's higher than the heavens. It's farther than the sun. It's wider than the earth. It is all over because that is who he is. Because love equals restoration. And what is God? He is love. So, oh my God. He 
can't, oh Jesus, he can't help but to desire to restore you because he loves you. Oh my God. Oh Jesus. See, and I, I want to preach this to you and I want to teach this to you because I want you to understand that we clap and we shout about blessing theology. We was on this yesterday. We clap and we shout about the theology of blessing, about God's going to turn the situation around. God's going to turn it this way and he's going to turn it that way. And we clap and we shout. We clap and we shout and we're coerced to give a thousand, five hundred, two fifty, a hundred, fifty, twenty-five, twenty. Who got five dollars? And we're coerced because of the theology of blessing. But one thing that we've missed is the theology of blessing has taken away our desire for the theology of change. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm preaching better than you, amen, because I ain't telling you about no money. But the theology of change is more important than the theology of blessing because the Bible tells me, and oh my God, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Come on, somebody, don't leave me by myself. The Bible lets me know that the theology of change is more important than the theology of blessing. Oh my God. But we've fallen into the trap. And I'll prove it to you when we read the story. Because we're going to read about Zacchaeus. Oh my God. The theology. Oh Jesus. The theology of change is so much more important than the theology of blessing. And some of you are like, but pastor, why? I don't understand. I've always shouted at my blessing. I was taught to shout at my blessing. But how many of you shouted at your change? Oh my God. shouted when God took the lust out of you? How many of you shouted when the anxiety left? How many of you shouted when the depression left? How many of you shouted when the anger left? How many of you shouted when the thing that you wanted God to change in you happened? Oh, oh my God, I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to myself and that's okay. But the theology of change needs to trump the theology of blessing because the theology of blessing gives us give and get. But the theology of change gives us a transformation in Jesus Christ, which is eternal. Somebody say eternal. Because the blessing I get going to leave this earth with me? No, it is not. But the change that I have, which equals my eternality with him, is going to be with me forever. Oh, my God. Don't leave me by myself. Therefore, if anyone in, is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things. Somebody say, all things. All things have become new. Oh my God. What does the next verse say? Now all things are of God. My change is of God. My being a new creation is of God. The Bible says that now all things are of God. Watch this. Who has reconciled or restored? He has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of what? Come on. Come on. Somebody know their Bible. Reconciliation. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses to them, not pushing it on them, punishing them for it, but reconciling them for it. God was in Jesus reconciling the world for all the things that the world has done and has committed us. Now, because God did that, he's committed us to the word of reconciliation. So he, oh my God, you want me to help you? You want me to help you? He's committed to you who know Jesus, the word of reconciliation. That means he's committed something to you to change so you can change and you can change and you can change. He's committed. That's 
changed theology. That's changed theology. He's committed this word to you so the world can be reconciled back to him. You want change? You want to walk out of darkness? Have a desire that's as deep as God's for you to have it happen. Come on. That's good. Don't walk away. Don't walk away when the desire fades. Can I tell you something? You know what? One of the top five things for failing the failure in marriage is when the desire for each other has left. What are one of the number one things you love about your relationship when it's young? Your desire for your wife. Your desire for your spouse. <laughs> Read the Song of Solomon. No, 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 not lust desire. Not, not for us as believers. Maybe for other people. That is a piece, but for us as believers, the desire to build. The desire to have children. The desire to see our offspring be a blessing, to live together. The desire to do God's work. The desire of what God will call us to do through marriage. The desire. When the desire fades, uh -huh. the marriage starts to fade. Uh -huh. Watch this. I say this almost every week if you ain't heard me yet. Who are we married to? Jesus. When the desire fades, the marriage starts to fade. The only difference is God's desire never fades. Minds can. So it's, oh my God, I'm by myself. So it's not, oh my God, it's not on God, it's on me to keep the desire. How many of us had a desire at one point and it's faded and it's shifted? How many of you, when you first were a new Christian, you spent more time with God than you did 10 years later? How many of us, we walked away from a church because something happened and we said, oh, well, the church did me like that, so I left God as well. Because our desire was in the church service on Sunday. It wasn't with God who's with me every day. Oh, am I by myself? Am I by myself? So because your Sunday friends hurt you, now your desire for God Monday through Sunday has faded. But your Sunday friends should never be able to take away the desire that God has for you and the desire that you have for him. Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus or oh, whatever. Listen to me, family. <clears throat> we dance and we shout and I'm okay with that. I want you to be clear. Don't nobody belong. He don't like it. No, I do. I like it when you dance. I like it when you shout. But I, I, I say this because I think we need to understand how important it is for us to dance and shout about God turning us around and turning the situation around. See, watch this. We say... <clears throat> God turn it around, referencing the situation, right? Which is great. God turn the situation around. I am not against that at all. I want to be very clear. I'm all for that. We did it last week. So I'm all for it. So I'm not being a hypocrite, but I want you to understand something. The joy that I have for God turning the situation around, I should express that same joy when he turns me around. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. Because sometimes I am the situation. I'm by myself. I done been in this situation before. <laughs> Sometimes I am the situation. If you've been in the situation, say me too. Say me too. Say I am the situation. Now say I was the situation. But God turned me around. I hope it's not going over your head, but when we can start to praise God for turning me around, oh my God, this situation, some, for some reason, tell me if I'm lying, they just seem to get less and less and less. For some reason, when God turns me around, I'm not always in the middle of something. what it is what was going on but God you turn me around and oh oh my god 
Oh, I'm by myself. And all that stuff that kept happening, it's happening less and less and less and less and less. That's who I see in it. Me. I can see me. When God can turn you around, you can see you. Yeah. Stare at a mirror and do a 360. Who do you see again? You. you. Mm-hmm. When God can turn you around, uh. situations can begin to change. Yeah. And I'm gonna prove it to you. <clears throat> Even if somebody else is at fault, uh-huh. if God can turn you around, it might not even turn into no situation. Yeah. Because what once would have been because of your actions, God done turn me around. I'm not even worried about you. What once would have been, Ty, me going back to the south side and me trying to fight everybody and their mama, God done turned me around. I'm not even worried about you. I'm not even worried about you. What once would have been when the situation arises, I'm not worried about it. But the theology of change doesn't get the same shout as the theology of blessing. Sorry, could you Because, Siri, be quiet. <laughs> All right, well, listen. Siri, Siri. I said the theology of change doesn't get the same shout as the theology of blessing. Listen, all right now, all right now, all right now. Somebody go, go bless Siri. Somebody bless that AI in the house. We might need to save Siri for we have an iRobot situation. So we might really need to think about that. Hey, um, but the theology of change doesn't receive the same joy as the theology of blessing is because the theology of blessing is more material and it's more in the moment. Yeah. And it's more right now. The theology of change is a process. And things that are processes don't always get the shout because a process can be long and hard and enduring and it can take a lot out of me for it to be completed. So the shouting about the process is what we really need to be screaming about. Because I said earlier, you shouted when the change happened, right? But now try shouting in the process. Try being excited and glorifying God in the process. Because it's not about how fast it happens, it's about glorifying God in the process. Because the more I glorify God in the process, the more my desire for it stays with me. Amen. I'm by myself. And I'll prove it to you. We shout over money and cars and material things, which shows our desire. You're shouting because you desire the Maybach. If I have somebody pull up right now and give you a brand new Cadillac Escalade, you gonna scream, you gonna shout, you gonna post on Facebook, you gonna thank your pastor, you gonna, oh my God, it's gonna be on all the social media. But, but if I pull a baptism tub out, and a hundred people leave it in the water, mm. only three of y'all gonna share it. Mm. My but if I pull an escalator, up, all y'all gonna no. share it. I'll put money on that most of y'all will. Yeah, yeah. Man, my church giving away escalades, <laughs> but then I'm gonna be in trouble. Why am I gonna be in trouble? Because what did you do, Lionel, for you to deserve an Escalade? Uh-huh. Why he give him an Escalade and not me? What did he do? <laughs> now I'm in trouble. 
because I've created the theology of blessing uh -huh. that give and get. So now when people aren't getting, the pastor and the church is in trouble because people aren't getting based upon what they're being taught that the more you give, you'll get back. But when you want somebody to really stay in church and keep their relationship with Jesus, you need to have more theology of change than theology of blessing. Because can I tell you what will stick with you forever? You never going back to the old you. Because you came to the body of Christ for a change anyways. So if the desire for the change starts to fade, what happens? The desire for the gospel fades. Desire for church. All these things start to happen. So then what reels me back in? Materials. I'll be honest with you, and I'm not against these things. I, I'm for whatever marketing people want to do. I'm, I'm not against it because you do what you do to get people to know Jesus. I'm not against it. There are things, but we've gotten into the theology of blessing so much that we offer people money just to come to church. And well, what do you think it is when churches say the first five new people get a hundred fifty dollar gift card? What do you think? I'm not against that, but I'm just trying to get you to see that we've turned materialism so bad and so, and we've turned it out in church so much that instead of allowing the, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I must be lifted up so that all men will be drawn nigh unto me. Right? That's the Bible. Instead of allowing Jesus who was lifted up to draw people, we come up with quick, with quick schemes and things like that to get them there. I'm not against any church that does that because Christ must be preached. But what I'm saying is we miss the fact that we're implementing the theology of show up and you'll get this. Yeah. So what happens is now every new person when they come to your church expects a hundred fifty dollar gift card. Amen. Well, why did Ken get a gift card and I didn't? That don't make no sense. Right. Now you got to institute a policy to give someone something for coming to church. Right. But the reality is Jesus gave what? Life. His life. Mm -hmm. If I got to give you money to come to church, how can you ever really understand the theology of change Amen. when you're only in church to get? Amen. 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 We ain't even get to the text. We'll get there. I swear we will. But family, we're going to read this text. Y'all ready? Yep. All right. We're in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. If you can stand for the reading of the word of God. Now, I want to point out a few things. Jesus entered Jericho. Y'all ready? Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. I want to point out something in Jericho, okay? Jericho was a major site for customs and goods that were entering Israel from the east. So we know that Jesus being in Jericho and Zacchaeus actually being the one who was a tax collector there, we kind of have a good idea that a lot of money was flowing through that place because it was a source for goods. Amen? Amen. So he probably, won, he probably had a little bag. He had a little something put up. So, verse 2, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich, which means he was viewed as a social outcast because he was a tax collector. That's me. That's my, that's my note, so stay with me. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. He, he, excitement and Jesus said, you going to come eat with me? Let's go. 
But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I'm going to go back to verse 5. And I just want to talk a little bit about 5 and we'll process through the rest of it. We have to understand that just like the presence accepted of hatred of the chief collector, the tax collector, the same way that they hated him, but Jesus was trying to show that even though you hate him, this person is still worthy of salvation. So Jesus is exception of him in front of all of these people is proof of the kingdom of God's power. So Jesus deciding to accept the person whom everyone else hated is proof of God's power. Now, I want to just just give me 60 seconds. Are you willing to accept the one whom everyone else hates? Mm. Are you willing to accept the one whom you. Should I use hate? That's a strong word. Dislike. Should I use dislike? No, we're going to use hate mm. because they hated him. Because he was working for the Roman government and was a traitor and was collecting taxes for people who had their foot on their neck. We don't like to use the term hate today because, oh, that's, that's hate speech. That's, but people got some hate speech. Some of us got some hate speech. And until you actually deal with the hatred that's down on the inside of you in your heart that's flowing through your brain that's coming out of your mouth you ain't gonna never really be able to understand what Jesus is doing here and we want to take out this word and say it's too harsh of a word but some of us is hard some of us is harsh some of us got some things that come out of our mouth that are just completely against who God actually is but once I can recognize it, I can ask God to pinpoint and isolate it and help me change it. Amen? So we know that he was not a fan to them. They were not fans of him. But Jesus is trying to show them, hey, listen, y'all know in our culture it's sacred for a guest to come and dine with you, right? And I'm going to go dine with the person whom you all don't like. And because in our culture it's sacred for us to dine with each other and I'm going to dine with whom you don't like, I need you to see that the one whom you don't like is the one whom, I'm, whom I love. And the one whom you don't like, and you're the one who doesn't like him, I still love you too. Mm -hmm. Jesus is trying to show a togetherness and a unity that comes through the gospel. Now remember, everything Jesus was taught was a kingdom-minded perspective, meaning a heavenly mindset. If there's a heavenly mindset, then what he's trying to teach us is the kingdom of heaven is going to be full of people. And because it's going to be full of people, we don't get to have the decision or the right to choose whom we like or we dislike. And I know that's a hard concept in 2024. Because there's a lot of things that we see on social media and stuff that people say where we think that we reserve the right to dislike and like whom we want. But that's a worldly perspective. It's not a kingdom perspective. Because if I follow Jesus and Jesus loved everybody, I have no right to dislike or hate anyone no matter what. And I know that that's not the best thing to hear and to be said because. And I, I just want to talk to y'all because I know with the way that we're taught now is we are taught if you don't like that person, you have every right to not like them. And you're correct if you're in the world. 
but can I say something? And please, I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to trigger nobody. But if I'm a Christian, I have no choice but to love everyone, Amen. even my, Amen. Of, even my offenders. Amen. So since I have no choice but to love even my offenders, what's stronger, love or light? Amen. Love. 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 If we're smart, we don't marry somebody we like. <laughs> we marry somebody we love. If we're smart, we don't like our kids. We love our kids. Because kids ain't always the easiest. You wasn't, I wasn't, my kids. It's the truth of life. So if I just like my kids, I may just give up on my kids. So if God just liked us, So God, in his infinite wisdom and knowledge, understood I have to be love yeah. because I have to love y'all people <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Because if I am just like, I'd have, what we talked about yesterday, the wheat and the weeds, <laughs> I'd have sifted y'all a long time ago. Oh. But because I love you, I won't sift you. Yeah. Right until the time is right. Uh -huh. But guess what? Every weed that gets sifted away from the wheat, it's not because God didn't give them the opportunity to experience his love. Yeah. Yeah. So because he is love, God has no choice but to be that. And Jesus is trying to give them a perspective of the kingdom of heaven. But now can we look at verse six? Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. So now Zacchaeus is encounter with Jesus. Now he has this encounter with Jesus and he gets joyful. How many of us is that? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, church was great. But other people are displeased. Why is he going to be a guest at his house? But remember when I said you have to desire restoration? You have to desire it. Listen to what he says. I will give half my wealth to the poor. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Now, I want to be clear. Now, hear me out. This is not about him willing to give money to the people he cheated. This is about his willingness to release himself from the things that he did through Jesus. And when he was willing to allow himself to be released from what he has done through Jesus, he had a desire to want to return or give back to those whom he had hurt. My desire has to run so deep that when I start to dine with Jesus, I have to start want to giving back or being a present in the places that I used to commit hurt. Right. And I also have to have a desire to allow the ones who hurt me yeah. at some point to have an avenue to express, for, to express asking me to forgive them. Mm -hmm. It's a two-way street. Yeah. And we see his desire wasn't just that Jesus ate with him. His desire was that he went back and he made up for the things he had done. Now, I know some of y'all say, but my salvation is free. I don't got to do. You're right. Your salvation is free. You're 100% correct. You can get baptized. You can get Jesus, all this stuff. You can, you can confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. You can have him. You can have all of it. You're, you're correct. You, you're correct. But remember, we're not talking about a salvation issue. We're talking about a desire issue. Yeah. 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 It's good. It's good. It's good. Uh -huh. You can be saved and lose your desire for Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But it's because God's desire for us never fails is why we still remain saved. Uh -huh. Because he desired that if these things happen, you are saved. So, okay, cool, you got that. 
But even though I'm saved, I still have to have a desire and a unction to want to have a relationship with Jesus. You said this last night to know him and the fellowship of his suffering. Oh, my God. So Paul knew him, but he said that his desire, what he wanted was to know him and the fellowship of his suffering. So he had a desire to know Jesus so bad that he wanted to know him and feel and understand the suffering. I know that's not popular text, but the desire for Jesus can fade even though I'm saved. And nobody in church really want to hear that because the theology of blessing, it increases finances, it increases attendance, it increases social media viewership, it increases a lot of things. But how many people, if there's 10,000 and all of them are under the theology of blessing, how many of them actually have Bentleys? How many of them actually have Mercedes? And then let's ask how many of them actually live paycheck to paycheck? 90% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Amen. So I don't care what church you go to, what blessing you supposed to be thinking you getting. 90% of us live paycheck to paycheck. Yep. So then look, she like me. Amen. So what that tells me is the theology of blessing must not be everything that they're telling me it is. Uh -huh. Because if it was true and I give and I get, why, why, why 90%? Come on. Amen. Come on. Amen. I just heard a pastor the other day. He said the black church alone makes $11 billion a year. He said, but black people alone spend $300 billion a year. That's what he said. So if the theology of blessing were correct, right? Then how? Come on. It's true. Then how come it's not being blessed? If the theology of blessing, now remember, mind you, I'm talking monetary and materialistic, okay? Let's be clear. If the theology of giving money and you get so much more back in return were 100% like, oh yeah, if I give 1,000, I'm getting 10,000 back. If that was true in every single instance, the church would have 300 billion and you would spend 11 billion. You see what I'm saying? Because if we give an 11 billion, shouldn't like it be, like, do you see the, so anyways, that was just a little note. But what I want you to see is this. Zacchaeus did the opposite. He didn't go and say, I'm going to give to get my money back. Yeah. He wanted to go and give to fix what he did wrong. Yeah, right. Change. 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 The theology of change makes me want to give, not to receive back. But because I'm so joyful about what you changed me from. And the more theology of change I get in my life, the more joyful I am when I see your life change. I should celebrate with you when I see a change more than I see the car. I'm by myself. I'm by myself, and I know I'm by myself because I see people on Facebook when they get new cars, it be music and it be reels and it be all type of stuff. But then when you change, you do it in quiet and nobody knows. Pastor, just to let you know, you know, I, God, he helped me with that. And I, I ain't did that in like a year. I've been doing really good, blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. When you got a new car, you thank your hubby. You thank, you, you even thank the car sales. <laughs> But when God turned you around, you kept it in your closet. And can I tell you why we do that? It's because we still live ashamed of who we used to be. And you know the other reason? It's because we judge so much as a church. So people are afraid to talk about what God has changed yeah, yeah. because if they talk about what God has changed, they're afraid that somebody else is going to judge them and they're going to talk about who you used to be. This is why I tell you, I don't care what you say about me. I'll tell you my whole story because God turned me around 
all the way to a point I don't have no shame in it. I'm like Zacchaeus. I just want to go and give everything back to the people that I used to take something from because he turned me all the way around. I'm not worried about what you say, 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 because I know the work that he did on the inside of me. I know where I was, and I know where I'm at now. And this man, he knew where he was, and he knew where he was going, because Jesus said, I'm finna sit down with you. Oh, come on, somebody. Don't leave me by myself to sit down and have dinner was love and friendship, unity, fellowship. If the rabbi is going to come and sit with me, that means he's telling me that he loves me. He's telling me he wants to have a friendship with me. He wants to be united with me. He's telling me these things, and I don't care what anybody else has to say. The Bible says that they grumbled, and they all hated this man. But the rabbi said, I love you. Right. Amen. Do you see the play on the situation? Jesus didn't even have to say I love you for him to understand he loved him. Because of the context of his words and his actions. The context of our words and our actions will release unto people how we feel. Jesus' words to him, I'm going to come and dine with you, and the action to him of showing up, let him know, wow, wow, he loves me. me." Mm -hmm. And imagine this, how many people you think was itching to have dinner with that man? man? But Jesus was. How many people was itching to be around you before you met him? Or, can I ask this question? How many people was itching to be around you before you met him because of what you could provide? What you could do? And now, how many of those same people are itching to be around you? Amen. You guys are gone. If you look in verse 9, Jesus says, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Why is this disrespectful? A, he's a tax collector. B, the Pharisees and the people believe that they were physical sons of Abraham. So by me saying, if I'm Jesus, this man is a true son of Abraham, I'm telling the rest of you, you're not. But the rest of you actually believe that you are. But Jesus is saying, no, this man is. The one whom you hate is the true son of your father. Because they call Abraham was their father. They called him father because they came from his lineage. Is the true son of your father, Abraham. The one whom you hate. So then the question then becomes, how can salvation come to a person's home whom everybody else hates? It's very simple. It's a five letter word. Jesus. Jesus showed up to sit with him. And salvation came to his home that day. Amen. Has Jesus showed up to sit with you? Have you been willing to allow salvation come to your home that day for the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost this is a political statement of Jesus going against the politics of the day because everyone thought he was lost Zacchaeus but he was the only one who was found so it's a political statement because all the politicians and the lawyers and all that do you know where we get lawyers from today The Pharisees back then, they were the legalistic experts of the law. They were legalism. So lawyers today are legalistic experts of the law. That's that's all all a Pharisee was. A modern day lawyer is just a Pharisee. Now I'm not saying a lawyer can't be a Christian, so please God, don't, 
Don't drag me through the mud. But what I'm saying is legalism and laws are what they studied and they knew. And Jesus was producing something within this person who's a tax collector and showing them that your legalism and your laws do not affect his salvation. Because salvation has come to his home today. But your legalism and your laws are affecting your salvation. Because while you think he shouldn't be saved, your laws are keeping you from seeing the kingdom of heaven that's right in front of you. I'm going to just say this as I close. Your laws, everything that you expect to be what you want it to be, all the rules and regulations and all of these things have the potential to keep away either salvation or desire. Salvation or desire. The more you put on me, sometimes the less desire I have. I'll prove it to you. The Pharisees got to the point, and the priest, of selling their seats. They got to the point of walking around with scriptures on them and being prideful. Because the weight of, watch this, the weight of the people was on them. The people expected them to be their voice to God and to teach them the scripture, to know the scripture. The weight of the people was on them. And so they had all of these rules and regulations. And do you know what one reason it was for? It was so that the weight of this stuff that was going on and that had been given to them by God, so it wouldn't be corrupted. But the weight of it still became corrupted because they weren't understanding the kingdom. And when the kingdom came, and this is all by God's design. Wait till we go to Isaiah next week. When the kingdom came, they couldn't see it because of the corruption and the tunnel vision of the legalism. God isn't in a box. He's everywhere. Amen. We as Christians have to step outside and see that God is everywhere and he's in everything. And we have to see the new creations that God has created. They were unwilling to see this man as a changed person. So therefore, it wasn't that he wasn't changing. It was that they were still stuck on the same old him. And so they got mad at Jesus. <laughs> Instead of celebrating the change mm -hmm. and can I just prove one more thing to you the kids gave away money the Pharisees took money they wanted materials mm -hmm. you were required to give them things right watch this the theology of give and get blessing and finances was back then just like it is today they required the people to give them things and do this and do that. And what they started doing was making the people give them above and beyond what was required of by God. And when the people started giving them above and beyond what was required of by God, they started becoming rich and wealthy. And when they started becoming rich and wealthy, oh my God, I got I to shut this down. When they started becoming rich and wealthy, you started to see it kind of tumbling and going downwards because they started getting more from the people than they were actually supposed to get. And when they were getting more from the people, now they're abusing because God said give this much, but people are giving this much. And then, hey, well, listen, hey, well, come on, keep it coming, keep it coming, keep it coming. And the more you give me, the more you're going to give back. God will forgive your sins. God will do this. God will do that. So keep it coming and keep it coming and keep it coming. So we started losing the change theology of what we're actually supposed to have because we, the leaders of the temple in other places, now they selling in the temple and it's a marketplace in the temple because more than likely you paying rent to sell in the temple because people are coming to the temple because they're desperate for God. Oh my God. Thank you, Jesus. They started losing their desire because the temple, I can't be desperate in the temple for God when every time I go to the temple for God, all you want from me is something. 
but I'm here because I desire something from heaven. But the only way I can get it is to give you something. So if I have nothing to give, oh my God, what am I going to do? So then my desire starts to fade. And it goes downhill. It goes downhill. That's right, guys. But if you notice something, Jesus and his apostles, disciples, they preach change theology. And when they preach change theology, you saw people being fully transformed. That's right. I do believe you can give $100 and get 1000 I believe that can happen. God can do anything, so I'm not... Yeah, yeah. Nothing he can't do. But my point is, change theology has to be pressed upon and pressed into more than just receiving something for what I'm giving. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about walk out of darkness, Jesus is sitting with you and he's decided to dine with you and sup with you. Don't allow your desire to be taken away. Don't allow it to be taken away because of Pharisees. Don't allow your desire to be taken away. You know why? Because your desire is what's going to transform the world. I love you guys. God bless you guys. We'll do the altar call. We'll do prayer. But I really strongly want to encourage you. Do not allow, if Jesus is at the table with you, do not allow yourselves to not be excited that you get to dine and have joy with him. Amen. God bless you.